the Lord be with you. And also with you. Hello, and welcome to this Presbyterian Association of Musicians Town Hall meeting on art, music, and sacrament. I um, will introduce our presenters in a moment, um, but first, I'm David Gambrell, Associate for Worship in the PCUSA Office of Theology and Worship. And um, in this webinar, we're going to be exploring some topics around uh, around the sacraments, especially baptism and Eucharist. Um, the The inspiration for this came from some articles in the journal Call to Worship, um, commemorating the 40th anniversary of the Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry resource of the uh, World Council of Churches, um, which was published uh, first in 1982. Um, and so our presenters will speak to connections between the sacraments and their uh, their interests and gifts around art and music. I see a note from Dave Iker in the chat, and uh, we say hi right back to you, Dave. And I want to encourage, as I do introductions, encourage others to um, sign in in the chat. Let us know um, where you are. Thanks, Charlie. Good to see you. Um, and we are so glad that you all are here. So now it is my um, honor and joy and delight to introduce two dear friends to you. Um, first, the Reverend Mary Margaret Flanagan, or Meg, who is currently serving as co-pastor at St. Giles Presbyterian Church in Greenville, South Carolina. Meg is a graduate of Furman University and Columbia Theological Seminary and ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA in 2007. Meg uses her lifelong interest in music education in her daily ministry, singing all parts of the liturgy in the sanctuary and beyond. She's proud to have been part of the Glory to God hymnal project and has been an occasional member of Pam's Montreat Worship and Music Conference faculty. Um, if Meg, if you don't mind me adding, I'll also say that your kids have great taste in music. Uh, <laughs> you shared with me that uh, one of your kids was was singing a song I, I wrote the other day, and that um, meant so much to me. Thank you. And now it is my honor and joy to introduce the Reverend Dr. Ann Laird-Jones, who is the year-round director of arts ministry at Montreat. Ann is a graduate of Eckerd College, Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, and Wesley Seminary in Washington, D.C., where she earned her D.M.N. in arts and theology under the guidance of Catherine Kapikian. She's been a Presbyterian Church USA ministry, minister for 40 years and is a member of St. Andrew Presbytery, where she serves as the stated supply pastor of the Sumner Presbyterian Church in Sumner, Mississippi. She splits her time between Montreat and Mississippi and is really looking forward to her 30th year of working with arts, worship, and theology in Montreat. Anne and her husband, Mike Caulfield, are really proud of their two adult children, Sally and Doug. And I'm really proud to say that I've known Anne for a long time. Anne was associate pastor at the church I grew up in uh, back in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So it's great to see you both and great to see other folks who have um, said hello in the chat. We are so glad and grateful you all are here. We are going to um, begin with uh, some some words from Meg Flanagan. Um, then we'll um, move to a time with with Anne Laird Jones, and then we'll come back to to Meg. And then we'll have a time at uh, at the end of our conversation for uh, questions from from you. So think about questions that you might have for our panelists, and um, you can use the chat or the Q and A feature to do that. So with that, I will hand it over to Meg. Meg, take it away. Thank you, David. I know many of y'all, and I'm so glad that we can be together on this dreary winter day and talk about meaningful things. Um, I was invited a while ago to be the music columnist for this uh, series of the Call to Worship magazine and uh, or journal. And I said, I think you've got the wrong person because I'm not a professional musician and I don't want to pretend to stand in those shoes. Um, but I am a lifelong musician, though I don't earn my salary that way. I'm 
been um, studying music and practicing and making music and leading music um, wherever I've been, actually. So um, in this first article about baptism, I used a musical metaphor to describe theology. I'd like to say our theology, but that might be bold. So I'll start with my theology and hope that maybe it will become your theology. We, of course, when we, whenever we, the church, talk about baptism, we talk about water, of course, and we start to think about sprinkles and drips and rivers and running living water and even pools. You might think about whether a small font or a larger pool or a river, and we think about how the water moves. Now, you may be like me and enjoy seeing baptismal water move in worship. Um, you may spray or sprinkle or splash and let other people do that too, um, but not every church does. And uh, so as I was thinking about music and baptism and connections therein, I started thinking about how just as water moves and waves and pools so does sound move and wave and pool. And I especially thought about um, handbells. I hope your volume is set appropriately. <laughs> and how you can hear and even feel in a handbell the way that the sound moves, that you can ring the bell, you can... Um, Marcato, make a marcato song where you sort of hit the bell against the table. You can dampen it on your shoulder and you, you feel how the sound flows through you, the musician, and then starts to flow beyond into the congregation or audience or space. And um, if you have a really big bell, like would be in a carillon tower, if you are standing there when the carillon rings, you, I mean, your whole body vibrates with it. And then, um, so that's a wonderful way, I think, of experiencing the movement, the living part of music and water and um you may have seen written before this famous carillon bell in Luck, Wisconsin. Luck is has a population of about a thousand people. So it's a small village. It has, as far as I know, always been a small village in our country that it was at one point the yo-yo capital of the world. Maybe didn't know that. <laughs> Luck was where there was a uh, a yo-yo factory. <laughs> but there also was a Lutheran church in this teeny tiny town that um, had a famous inscription on it that said, to font and table, to prayer and word, I, the bell, call every seeking soul to font and table to prayer and word i call every seeking soul in that that when the bell rings boom boom they're calling the village to come to prayer to font and table to prayer and word i call every seeking soul and indeed, the neighbors in that village heard the bell, and when the bell was destroyed by a fire at some point in the um, towards the end of the 20th century, the people have missed that bell. I don't know if they've missed the church, but they have missed the bell. And that says something about the place of um, the movement of those baptismal waves and the music waves as they carry out into the community. Sound waves can travel infinite miles as long as there's air or a vehicle to carry that wave on. And in our baptism, then, the ripple of who God is and what God is doing with us, that ripple could, in theory, travel infinitely as long as there is a vehicle to carry the wave. And the vehicle, of course, is us. 
that as we gather around the font, as we're splashed, as we make our own ripples, we carry it with us in word and song and prayer from the font and the table. We go out and call every seeking soul. One of the things that I'm always fascinated by as a pastor is that um, between the two sacraments, people of all ages seem to delight in baptism. They see the font full. They want to stick their hands in it. They giggle. They, um, if you splash them in worship, it's oh, oh, and um, there's a real reaction to what's happening there around the font. And I would argue that that's where we become the true church, that people show a little bit more of who they really are, and they delight a little bit more in who others are. And um, so that was my, the thought behind my article there is that um, we might ride the waves, the sound waves, and let that be an inspiration for how we live out our baptism in the world. Wonderful. Thank you, Meg. And as Meg has just suggested, uh, there are articles where you can read more about these thoughts in the journal Call to Worship, uh, published by the Office of Theology and Worship um, under the fabulous editorship of Sally Ann McKenzie, who I see is also with us today. So I do encourage you, if you haven't already, to read these articles by Meg and Anne. So now we'll turn to Anne for your part of the presentation. And would you like me to go ahead and share my screen, Anne? Or do you uh, have just a second? Yes. So we'll just say it. Um, so by. welcome to you all. And it's so great. I can't really see you, but I'm imagining you. And one of the questions that I pondered when um, I got the invitation to write two articles, one on baptism and one on Eucharist on um, the visual aspects of these, I just started thinking. And one of the first thing I did was to ask as many people as I could, what do you see when you think of baptism, first of all, and got so many stories. My One of my favorites is my friend Gaden, who says that second babies often walk down the aisle to the font because their parents have long given up on making the family baptismal gown uh, fit. And, you know, it just reminded me, we think of the babies, we think of the history of the families, we think of the return of and gatherings of families. Um, we, uh, I also think of my friend Catherine, who at Montreat, uh, loves to lead the confession, um, forgiveness, declaration of pardon sequence in worship. And one of the reasons she does is there's a beautiful font there and she just splashes water so that water goes to the back of the auditorium. And I think that really awakened me to the sense of, when, you know, that question, what do you see when you um, think of baptism? And too often, I think we think of the baby, the dress, is the baby going to cry? Are the parents going to make it through? Are the siblings going to do weird things? What do we think about? And instead, how can we move to thinking about baptism in a much bigger way? So I started thinking about the word choreography and wrote both articles from that stance of choreography. And so then I changed, I started asking all my friends who are dancers what they, what choreography means. And, you know, it comes uh, it, it has to do with intentional movement, guided direction, attentiveness to movement, nothing is static, but really it comes from the idea of choro, which means chorus, like the Greek chorus, the movement of the, the whole body reacting to something that's being said or done, and then uh, graphy, which has to do with writing, with words, response to words. So it's this, you could really see choreography as this transformative dance of visible and invisible. Um, so then I started thinking about that in terms of what is the movement that we see in scripture with Jesus, John the Baptist, the crowds, the hand of God, this dive bombing dove, um, the water, you know, what do we, what do we see in this? What do we see when we look at the text about baptism, not only Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but also in Acts 8, Peter and John in Samaria, first Peter, uh, the cleansing of the people. What do we think about when, you know, in Colossians, Paul's focus in the transformative story of God. What do we think about in Isaiah 43? When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. How does that happen in our sanctuaries where we really don't want to see waters and rivers running through? 
Um, what, what, how do we see Matthew 28? What, uh, remember I am with you always to the end of the age. And these water images that are throughout the Bible with everybody from Jonah, the Samaritan woman at the well, Noah, Jesus walking on water. There's so many visual images. And yet how often when we think of baptism, do we really think about the dress, the siblings, the uh, the anxiety of the parents and where this fits in the service so that everybody will make it through. And it really interests me if, if we think about baptism as choreography, uh, moving from just a list or kind of a perfunctory idea or, or a prescriptive um, understanding of how we do this. And even the visual, the little font that is often in the corner because there's not room up front, especially when the Christmas tree has to go someplace and the little bowl in there. And did we put water in it? Instead, to think about the whole service as moving water and choreography. So thinking about this, um, I started thinking about that kind of flood, thinking of baptism in terms of the flood of memory and, and the flood of, of what's happening now and the flood of grace upon grace and the, just the flood of how baptism really is a, a central part of the whole service. So I started thinking about um, how do we, if we look back in art history, where do we, and this is where we're gonna turn to sharing the screen. I just started looking at some, there, there are you know, lots of paintings and images about uh, baptism. And so we're going to go down to Giotto for our first one. There we go. Let me, um, there we go. Yeah. So again, choreography, the chora, the chorus, the graphy, the writing. Um, and, and, you know, you think about the, how does the community imagine grace upon grace and visible and invisible grace? So, um, it was really interesting turning to some of these different works of art, and we've put them in. Um, I really want to, again, thank David for so many things, including he put these images, he took them out of the manuscript and put them in a PowerPoint, and they're in your chat, and Catherine's going to um, provide them as a resource to you, because what I'm hoping you'll do is take some time and just study these, live with these, um, imagine these, and, and see how we can kind of move from just seeing baptism as a list or of, of holding our breath anxiety because we don't want the baby to cry or something to go wrong or to forget the right words, but instead to see this as the memory of grace upon grace. So here's this first one. Um, here is a, uh, this is the Italian painter and, and, and architect Giotto who lived in Florence in the late middle ages and is famous for his frescoes, which are um, um, paint murals set into wet plaster. But what he's really known for is he was able to move to, to, to kind of create depth instead of sort of two-dimensional Jesus, Jesus with no body, because heaven forbid he would have a body, that there's this perspective that's introduced. He's no longer bodiless, but he's and his body is not hidden. In fact, in this, he's pretty naked and he looks very real and three-dimensional and he's standing in the water up to his waist. And there are, you know, look at the figures on either side of Jesus. Um, three men on one side, three angels on the other. These trios, they seem a little motionless, pointing toward Jesus who moves in correspondence to this, this burst of light from above. And, and, and in the and above, you see the very hand of God reaching down um, uh, from the top of the picture plane, which was pretty pretty normal, but he, Jonah's done something different. Look what he's done. He's included the face of God in this. And, and so this is the focus of our attention is on the face of God in the midst of this moment of grace upon grace. And we've got, you know, Moses and Elijah there with John the Baptist, and we've got angels and, and, and people, but it's just something that there's movement in this that I found very uh, moving. There's a, there's a, there's a, it's, it's choreography. It's just something that is different than just a list or a series of words that maybe feel a little flat. Um, you know, it's interesting in the earliest days of the church, uh, baptism was usually out, performed outside in rivers or fountains, but then later, maybe because of persecution, we see baptisms happening in, in houses and in places of worship. And even some of the earliest baptismal 
who were they, but they were they were they were like almost cruciform kinds of pools of water, almost reminding the church of the tomb um, and of the dying to old life and rising to new life in Christ. And so you remember the word baptizo actually means to drown. And so lots of water, the earliest baptismal fonts, sometimes even in the shape of, of a sarcophagus, uh, showing that we actually die to the old and are raised to the new, very far from the little bowl of water that we hope has water in it when we get to that point in the service. Um, and the, the next slide is a, is a painting called The Baptism of Christ by Tintoretto. And I mean, it's uh, if if you want to read more about it, there, I was really fascinated that Tintoretto worked for uh, about six years on this, and this, and there was a whole series of paintings that he did um, to kind of depict what the Bible is all about. But he um, he used these bold colors, high contrast, uh, lots of movement, and he had uh, technique dry brush and glazing techniques that added texture and depth of color. But but think about that bold movement and lots of stuff going on. I mean, it's just wild in this painting that uh, this is the paintings the, the, the painting emphasizes the fruits of Christ's baptism, newness of life, faith, hope, charity. And unlike many other paintings of the baptism of Jesus from this period, nothing is neat or organized. So just remember this, nothing is neat or organized. Crowds of people streaming uh, golden light, billowing clouds twist around Jesus. Light pours from the sky onto the figure of Jesus right in the moment that John pours the water on Jesus's head. And... Um, just, you know, the, 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 a figure holds a veil in the lower right corner, if you see down there, and the, um, with the words, hope that is seen is not hope. Romans 8, 24, a mother nurses her child. Um, and the, those who are looking on, there's just so many people, they're, they're, there's a sense that, um, of hope and of moving someplace in this painting. Um, now, what interested me, I was working on this last spring, right as Russia attacked Ukraine, and we're going to go on. The next three paintings um, were done by Orthodox Christians, two from Ukraine, one is Polish. Uh, this first one, The Baptism of Jesus by Ivanka Demchuk, a uh, Ukrainian artist born in 1990. So we've jumped really far from Tintoretto to uh, 1990, but I was fascinated in all three of these. The focus is on water. And Jesus is just in the midst of this water. And think from our little fonts and little bits of water, just this, this emphasis on water bubbling and falling and splashing and sort of jumping out at us. And um, in this one, there are the, the three angels, bystanders, and they're sort of assuming traditional postures. But Jesus, in some ways, looks almost entombed in this, wrapped in cloth. And yet the water feels so real and moving that we have a sense that Jesus is not staying there, that something in hap is happening, um, maybe like the waters of the creation or the Red Sea pouring down upon Pharaoh and his armies. But the, the water is taking us and it just moves our eye. And I hope you will take some time and spend with this um, and just see what, where the choreography of this is. The next painting is called The Baptism of Christ by uh, Sviatoslav uh, Vladika, and I'm hoping, hoping I'm saying uh, the name correctly, a Ukrainian artist uh, who uses tempera and gold leaf on, on board in uh, his contemporary icons. But look at this, again, water, but in this time, the water is a blue circle um, around Jesus, and it's reflecting this heavenly light streaming from the circle at the very top of the painting. Uh, the face of G John, the face of God, form a protective embrace around Jesus. You see the two faces on the sides. And then the dove, here comes the dove, uh, like a, uh, almost like a spider as uh, lowered on Jesus's head by a single thread. And then the third um, painting by an Orthodox uh, Christian artist is by uh, Jerzy Nowosielski, a Polish graphic artist who died in 2011 who painted, this is just one of my very favorites, the baptism of Jesus Christ in the Jordan and these bold fields of um, beautiful color that depict the very agency of baptism with uh, these orange circles to 
depict the presence of the divine. And you see onlookers sort of looking um, in the background and from a distance, the Jordan River ver runs vertically through the painting, connecting the action of Jesus's baptism to the seemingly endless sea of water, um, which is actually at the top of the painting. And it's John baptizing Jesus in the middle of the painting, but it's this, this luscious watery square of blue and green and turquoise. I just can't quit looking at this one. There's so much depth. There's so much perspective. There's so much agency here. Um, moving down, you see a, an interesting um, painting by Mark Rothko, uh, who was an abstract expressionist painter, um, 1903 to 1970. And he's, you know, you've seen his later paintings, the large squares and rectangles of color moving almost, but not quite to the edges of the canvas. Uh, his whole quest was meaning. And I think I found, I, I was really drawn to that, 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 of how do we find meaning in what's happening in this choreographed moment of baptism? Um, you know, I read his work reflects his desire for his viewers to connect with his deep emotions as the colors wash over us, spill onto us, pull us into infinity. But this one, I just loved. It's full of doodles and lines that melt in and out of the background, and they create this sort of watery depth. And again, this artistic choreography by Rothko, imagining the baptism of Jesus, is not um, static. It's not flat, but there's this just sense of movement and, and, and so much happening, the efficacious uh, nature of grace, both visible and invisible, tumbling and moving and, and flowing. Um, moving on, you see there's a painting called The Bay by Helen Frankenthaler, and I was interested in thinking about artists who use color and form and movement to make work that may evoke the choreography of baptism for us, even if it's not specifically about baptism or called baptism. But one of the things that Helen Frankenthaler liked to do is take material like paint and pour it onto material like canvas and see how it moved and see where it went and not being able even to predict where it was going to flow. And I like that idea in church of, of realizing that choreography of grace upon grace is really about seeing this and imagining this movement. We don't know where it's going to go, where it's going to extend, water spreading out, and uh, this is happening. The next one is um, just a little, little view of um, the last work that Henry Matisse did before he died was to, uh, he was fascinated with what he called the Vents Chapel, his final masterpiece. And in, in the Vents Chapel, what he was doing is working with light as that which flowed, as that which helped us imagine water, as that which helped us imagine grace. And so the whole space was filled with limitless light. And I found that really intriguing to imagine light like water. And then finally, you will recognize this is, uh, those of you who have been to Montreat, those of you who are going to head directly to register for this year's worship and music conference, um, this is the, this is in the auditorium at Montreat um, Conference Center, and this is liturgical fur furniture that was made by um, Eric Thompson, who is a master craftsman and theologian who lives in Greensboro, North Carolina, who brings ministry and wood into the same sentence and out of which we see water just flowing everywhere. Um, he designs the liturgical pieces that emulate each other, font, table, pulpit, work together as a centerpiece for sacrament. Um, and here's something he said, that he believes the baptismal font should function on a daily and weekly basis, serving as the very center of the action of corporate confession and forgiveness. And that is a reminder that those of you heading to Presbytery, we have a really great amendment that will um, be focused on uh, on how we can how where we can put baptism in the service, not as a place going on a list, but really seeing the service as a whole movement of grace. But he says our worship space must be designed to facilitate worship. And to move in worship, we must have space in which to move, and we have space in which to sit or stand. Our spaces have to be redesigned in order to accommodate movement, and this won't happen until the congregation arrives expecting to move. So this movement um, reminded me this last slide in, in this series on baptism is of the creek at Montreal, which is right behind the pottery 
And when there are rains like we've had in these recent days, it's just full and running and, and noisy and just the, the choreography of grace upon grace. When I heard this, the sound of the creek on that day when I took this picture, I imagined the words from Isaiah, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through these waters, I will be with you and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. Um, the next slide is of the, of the table at Montreat and, and thinking about the Eucharist as choreography as well. And uh, one of the things I love about this is 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 we're always moving things on the table and moving things so they're in relation to ship to each other and some you know you you never know what you're going to see when you when you come into that space but this one i loved with these fish who all seem like they're just talking to each other and thinking about the choreography of the lord's supper realizing that the lord's supper is not just um, a, a a series of words and phrases with a few actions thrown in but this choreography of gathered space and even in an empty sanctuary we are so drawn to this lord's table and we can imagine all the things that are about to happen um an author andre sinyavsky's Sin Sin description of a novel the most rudimentary rudimentary thing about literature is that words are not deeds words are not deeds the lord's supper is not just words but action deed visual at every turn choreography memory and imagination and 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 hope and wondering where we are going next you remember that uh, vatican ii um, and we'll go ahead and switch to the next slide one of the great things about vatican ii is that um the 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 table no longer was was the table removed from the people, but the table came out into the midst of the people. And so I was so moved when First Presbyterian Church Asheville went through a discernment pe period and realized that they wanted to completely reconstruct their whole chancel and sanctuary so that the table uh, became, uh, was the center of the people. It's round, it's made from pieces from the old um, Ray Ray Das and other and older parts of that area, but but now the table is in the midst of the people. And here's a table that dominates not only the chancel, but the entire sanctuary, a table with no beginning, no end to which all are welcomed. And if, you'll, if you can kind of see from this picture, even the lighting above the table echoes that circular design and the bold metal circular light installation uh, shows the form of the table, embracing the table with 12 lanterns. And the vision of the table extends and emulates font and pulpit as the action moves forward. So then what I wanted to do is again, look at some of the art and I'm gonna go on down to this painting by Fra Angelico. I started to look at um, um, just, there are, there are actually a lot of pictures and paintings and, and um, carvings of the Lord's Supper. And I looked at some different uh, work of different artists, but here's something that was really interesting to me is that, you know, one of uh, the real regrets of the Reformation was this, uh, the, uh, the iconoclasm that happened when so much art was destroyed, windows were destroyed, countless altarpieces, visual depictions of the life of Jesus destroyed. Um, and, but it's interesting that much of the art about the Lord's Supper um, survived, survived uh, paintings and carved to, uh, sculptures that support the theory that even in the midst of destruction of iconoclasm, there was a curiosity about the role and presence of Christ at table. And so again and again, you see in these paintings and carvings, you see this intimacy between Jesus and the people who follow him and the human need to somehow imagine God's presence visually. And so I just wanted to show you a couple. Um, so Fra Angelico, did this painting, it's a fresco actually, the communion of the apostles. And, and uh, it's interesting because when I looked at this, I was intrigued with how weighted this is to the left side as if the disciples behind Jesus at the table are leaning into him, compelling him to come closer. And you see his bare feet uh, still to be washed maybe in the hour of his death. There are four stools awaiting kneeling disciples, maybe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John 
A woman kneels in the lower left-hand corner of the fresco, maybe Mary. Uh, the compositions just find so much balance in the well to the right, is it? And you see in the right-hand corner, is it living water? And Jesus holds what appears to be a chalice with a plate on top as he offers bread and wine to each disciple. And then immediately outside the windows are other buildings, each with similar open windows. It seems to stretch to infinity, the choreography of the Lord's Supper. The next um, painting is called The Last Supper by Juan de Juanes. Um, and in this painting, Judas in yellow, you see, if you look real closely, Judas is in yellow, holds a bag of coins, sits on a stool inscribed with his name. He's the only disciple without a halo. He looks as though he's about to leave the scene. But Jesus's gaze focuses on him. Even the knives on the table point to him. And the role of betrayal is woven into the theology of grace, but also the role of forgiveness and the, and the overreaching role of love. Uh, the, next, the next image is a carving that I love, the Roclaw Last Supper. It's an anonymous 15th century relief sculpture showing this very intimate scene frozen for all time and yet filled with movement. And it's just, it's just the, the word choreography just really stands out. Um, it was not destroyed in, during the, um, the time of the iconoclasm, but remains as a moving example of visual um, liturgical choreography. So look at this. We see, look at all the postures. Some of the disciples are lying down. Some have their hands open. Some have their hands clasped. They're gathered around. Their hands point in many directions. And your eye just can't hold still. Your eye just moves around this. And, and, and you wonder about all the liturgical meaning. And one thing I want you to notice is in the bottom left-hand corner, look at the size of those carved feet the giant bare feet of the disciple at the bottom of the sculpture sculpture, as he washes uh, the feet of the one next to him, as even as his feet have just been washed by another. Nothing is static. Everything is moving. Everything is happening. It's just there's a sense of, of love and intimacy, and we just want to get closer and closer to Jesus, and we want him not to forget us. The next is uh, Leonardo da Vinci's very famous um, mural of the Last Supper. But here's one thing about this that I want you to notice. Um, rather than a round table, which the other paintings and frescoes have, have depicted, this is this really long, narrow, rect I mean, this could be a table in our churches, these long rectangular tables. Um, the, this one, so we see this move towards symmetry and this angular clarity of the later Renaissance. And even look at the cloth on the table. It's not wrinkled. It's completely symmetrical with the rest of the painting, um, even despite the chaotic theological action that's already in motion. And in The Last Supper, this linear perspective designed to kind of create depth on a two-dimensional sur uh, surface but look at the hands of the disciples reaching out to Jesus. Is it I, Lord? Is it I? And um, and 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 also the um, one thing that really interested in this is that uh, that Leonardo da Vinci not only used facial expressions, but and not only just the hands and the postures, but the perspective. Because if you'll look, everything in this painting emanates from the point. Uh, placing uh, of Jesus's right temple and um, right behind that everything comes from there which is an interesting idea okay the next slide is um, shows this really giant it is giant it is it expand it was designed to span the whole width of the um, the, the stage in Anderson Auditorium it was a paper cut banner made by Hannah Garrity um, for a worship service in 2012. Now, originally when this was done, the focus was on, um, she kind of changed the directions of the hands. So instead of pointing to the, to the hands pointing to themselves, is it I, Lord, uh, they're pointing towards Jesus. However, um, the, you know, in an effort of trying to make this so it didn't look like this paper cut, because somebody came in and said, oh, it's paint by numbers or something. And we were horrified. So we went back to the drawing board and decided to introduce doves. So look at all the doves in this composition, which makes it just so it's just, they're just flying all over the place. And and it and it, it has this sense of celebration and joy 
And we want you, the viewer, to have this sense of the rush of wind, the Holy Spirit. Bread is broken, cup of salvation is shared, eyes are opened to grace upon grace. Hannah Garrity, our liturgical artist at Montreat, did these, this painting, um, which is on the stage in the auditorium, but then these were some of the um, original drawings, the, um, the templates to kind of figure out what we were gonna do. And in this one, um, what the question we had was, how do we depict, you know, this choreography of intimacy, which is happening at the Lord's table, and particularly in Anderson Auditorium, which is like a giant cave. And so we tried to imagine, and you remember in some of the earliest um, depictions, for instance, of baptism, the hand of God is, all, is often there. And this one, we tried to imagine the hands of God holding us with movement going on in the sacrament of communion. Uh, the next one is a work by Catherine Kapikian, who's the founder and director emerita of the Henry Luce Center for the Arts and Religion at Wesley. And she uh, uh, had had this image. This is the dining hall at the seminary. And she thought, what about putting the Last Supper up on this soffit? And so there's a sense of sacrament in a place where we gather for at table in a different way. Um, so using the Fibonacci mathematical principle of expansion, well, you know, that, that goes and there's no termination, she designed, she kind of took Leonardo da Vinci's idea, but, um, but, but changed it so that it would be a sense of eternal movement in this. And she had, it was a real effort of participatory aesthetics with COVID in the mix. It took years and um, many, many people worked on this. It's three-dimensional, it's made of wood, it comes out from the wall, and it's really an interesting process. But her focus is the interaction between Jesus and his disciples around the table. And it's all exemplified through, again, the gesturing and, and the moving of the hands that are expressing this, this choreography of emotion that happens at table, um, fear, anxiety, anger, love, joy, and strength, not to leave out the desire when we come to table that this moment will go on forever. Um, the next the next is um, um, a print by uh, Sadao Watanabe of The Last Supper in 1973. And I actually keep this in my study and have loved it for a long time. It's a hand-colored Kapazuri stencil print on washi handmade paper. But uh, his process is part of the power of, of his work, that he only used natural materials. All the paper was made by the fibrous bark of kozo, which is a mulberry tree made by farmers in northern Japan. And um, he actually crushed seashells to make the black. The red came from the pulverized bodies of the female cochineal, a cactus feeding insect. The blue came from the leaves of the indigo plant. But look at this cozy meal as, and, and imagine our gathering around table to celebrate the Eucharist in this cozy way. Look at that giant fish in the middle eyeing everybody. And, and the, there's broken bread and Jesus's hand is outstretched in front of him. And there's just this natural sense of supper with people that he loves. Um, and, you know, they, they, they really inhabit a different spiritual space from the swooning, open mouthed saints who roll their eyes heavenward in grief or ecstasy in much of, you know, sort of Western religious art since the Baroque period. Um, but they're the body language and the, the devotion and the intimacy and the, that, the sense of what if we look at the space in our sanctuaries as we come together in this, and, and, and imagine this intimate dance with Jesus. The very last image that I wanted to show you is from Sir, Sister Corita Kent. Um, oh, and one more, but Watanabe. Go back to Watanabe real quickly, if you don't mind. Um, I love this quote that he gave. He says, the practice of making art was a form of worship for him. He says, as I grow older, my work becomes less of myself and more of my Lord. His depiction of the Eucharist includes us all at this deeply spiritual level of being one with God and one with this table of grace. So now Sister Corita Kent, who was um, a great artist in the West Hollywood area, and she became fascinated with, a, with a, uh, you know, the, the work of that time. 
And um, one of the things that she noticed, uh, I think she was very influenced by the artist Andy Warhol, who would look at real things like Campbell soup cans and try to imagine them differently. But in this one, Sister Corita Kent looked at uh, Wonder Bread. You remember, I think Wonder Bread had just come out. I remember in the early 60s, that was a really big deal if my parents would buy a loaf of Wonder Bread for the daily peanut butter sandwich, it was magical. But it became, you know, it took on a meaning of its own. So she took Wonder Bread and evoked the Eucharist. Uh, you know, the copied it 12 times and imagined this scene, not as the 12 realistic disciples, but as this gathering of related, related, um, you know, look at the different colors and the different sizes, but yet there's a relationship as they come together. Um, one man said that about her that she took words and graphics meant to be read and understood instantly and tricked us into looking at them longer. She did this by both recontextualizing common messages and manipula manipulating familiar images. So I guess, in, in, and I've, I know I've just talked too long, but I'm so excited about seeing these colors and imagining how different people have tried to imagine baptism and Eucharist. And I hope that, that none of us will ever walk into a sanctuary and see emptiness, but instead see fullness and imagine the dance that is going on there. And may we, may we see a world of God's beloved people crowded around table. May we imagine and remember the saints who have gone before us and even dare to imagine those who will come after us, all of us crowding in to touch the hands of Jesus, all of us crowding in to feel the water spraying out of us, all of us crowding in to be uh, uh, filled with joy and delight, knowing that God's hands and ours have touched. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And we uh, return now to Meg um, with some thoughts on music and Eucharist. And um, I will put links to um, Anne's PowerPoint presentation in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, be thinking about your questions for Meg and for Anne. Thank you, Anne. You have really brought us in. I felt myself getting closer in the screen to see the images. And I mean, I think that's our hope as worship leaders that people do in worship, that they want to get closer to the elements and um, closer to the action. In my own experience, I see, and I mentioned this earlier, I see people doing that naturally in baptism. They want to get closer to the water. They want to touch it and sprinkle it. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know that I see the same response to the Eucharist. I unfortunately hear people making comments when they come in the door and they see the sanctuary set for communion. People say, oh, people say, oh that long prayer. Oh, Mm, I don't have time for this. There's one person in our my church right now who has told me that they hate communion, which breaks my heart. I mean, how can, but they, they hate the heaviness that comes with it. And um, I don't take those comments lightly. I take them very seriously in this age of worship where we've all had to do communion and sacraments in distant and different ways where we've been more mindful of the time we have and the way we share it with people who are at a distance. I think, okay, well, how is this sacrament, which is so holy, sacred, special to us, how can we make people want to get closer to it in the same way they do with the font? How can we get people invested in the Eucharist? So if we look at history, music, and probably art, but I know more about music, music has been a tool that people have historically used to make the Christian faith more accessible for all people of all ages. Reformers used music to teach the theology and spread their theology. There are so many stories and historical documents of travelers writing about they were coming into a town and they heard people singing a certain song therefore they knew that the town not just the house but they knew that the town had this particular theological presence um, especially around evening prayer and 
Mm. Of course, instead of in the mass, if they were hearing uh, vernacular and not just Latin. So I live in the southeast part of the United States. And in my part of the world, I imagine that would be like if instead of driving into town and seeing orange and white flags and hearing Rocky Top, I see orange and purple flags and hear the tiger rag from Clemson or, you know, it, take it and put it in your own cultural context. But it's that same sort of thing that's happening there hearing a, a tribe a group of people's song and they're associating then the whole area with oh my gosh this is Tennessee country this is Clemson country oh my gosh this is Protestant this is a Protestant town or this is a Catholic town um, so music was a way of helping illiterate people carry the theology of worship beyond the doors of the sanctuary so before when the music when the priest was speaking in latin when the priest was the only one who knew the words they sort of kept the secret to themselves but when they started speaking in the vernacular and teaching people songs in the vernacular they left singing now think we all are God with heart and they started embodying what that meant and being able to share that melody with their neighbors as they worked in the field or put their kids to bed or um, whatever it is and the people then came back to church and they could sing the words with the priest or pastor it wasn't just the action being done up there but it was the people gathering around the table together knowing and understanding the words mm -hmm. together this is big i still think yeah. that our hymnal is the best most used theological textbook that your average christian has this is the book that people that teaches people what we believe and we underestimate its value. We underuse it, honestly. So John Calvin wrote, it is fully evident that unless voice and song, if interposed in prayer, spring from deep feeling of heart, neither has any value or profit in the least with God, but they arouse God's wrath against us if they come only from the tip of the lips and from the throat. He's saying, right? So you're looking for a deep feeling of heart. Calvin writes, or else it has no, no value. Anne was saying earlier, words are not deeds. It's the same idea Calvin is saying here. Words are not deeds. That faith is not just from the tip of the lips, from the throat. Mm -hmm. Faith comes from the depth of feeling. So um, one way I experience this practically, and you probably too, is in um, our family blessings at the supper table. And I wrote about this in the article that our I have two little boys who are six and three, and we've been saying and singing blessings with them since they were too little to understand what was happening. And there's a... Um, hymnal uh, or a hymn in the hymnal is number 660 you can look it up if you have glory to god 660 which our kids call the bum bum blessing it that's not what it's called in reality and i can't tell you how it became the bum bum blessing but it's one of their favorites and they've never they still can't read so they still haven't seen it in the book and read it there but they just say what blessing do you want to do and they look, you know, and they're like the bum bum blessing. So I'm going to get you wherever you are right now to um, be a little edgy and participate with me. So if you want to, um, the bottom parts of this, this is such a congregational friendly piece, which is why we do it at our family table. The bottom part, it's an open fifth, like bum, 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 bum. You can do this. Bum, bum, bum. You can say Tom, but my family says bum. I don't know. And um, then the other people can go dum, 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 dum. And then someone, it could be a group. It could be one person. When our family does it, it's one person's. These are the real words. Lord, we thank you for this food. Help us share with all in need. Body, soul, refresh anew to live the gospel. Serve your people. And if you spread out the parts like that, it's a great way of involving everyone. And you don't have to show anyone that it's in your hymnal. You can just have the congregation sing a table blessing with you. And it's also a good way of embodying other people around the world. 
Now, when you don't open the hymnal and you let other people lead the prayers, which they should do, it might sound something like this. This is what I heard at my dinner table two nights ago. I'm going to approximate it. It was, Lord, we thank you for this food for sharks and muffins and my friends. We pray for Ukraine and sick people. God, thank you for our family. Amen. It's not right by the textbook, but that doesn't matter to any of us around the table because it's a heartfelt prayer that's using the hearts and hands, the depth of the heart of the people sitting at the table. You can do this in your congregation. You don't have to just read a prayer that's in the Book of Common Worship. You know, you don't have to write this long thing that has people in the pews going, oh, not again, this long prayer. I hate communion. To find a way to get them involved in the sacrament. I see the similar kind of enthusiasm happening with youth who go to camp and then they come back and they sing, thank you, God, for giving us food. Thank you, God, for giving us food. You know, they get excited to sing a certain kind of blessing. That's what we want. That's what we want at the communion table every day, every week with the community. I'll read that Calvin again. Unless voice and song, if interposed in prayer, spring from deep feeling of heart, neither has any value or profit in the least with God. So that's my challenge. That's always the bar to which I'm working, a way that the congregation can wholeheartedly and deeply participate in the sacraments. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Meg, and thank you, Anne. Um, what wonderful presentations, and I love the the threads and intersections um, among, among your comments and thoughts. In light of the time, we're just a, a few minutes away from closing. I want to move immediately to some questions and comments in the, or in the chat. Um, Josh Taylor asks, Anne, do you know if this, uh, where this Fra Angelico piece is in the museum? No. Josh comments that so many of his frescoes in the mon monastery yeah. mimic the architecture of the room where they're located. And so they're often in a room where action takes place. And he's wondering if this might have been in a refectory. Yeah, really um, good question. Which I don't takes... know, because that's something I loved about what Catherine Kopikian did, that it was in the context of that space. Yeah. No. And Josh notes that that takes choreography and art to even a different level. Yeah. Um, Great question. Thank you. Hannah McIntyre notes, uh, I had three people refuse to take communion because we did it by intinction, not because of COVID or physical limitations, but because communion is supposed to be, and she put supposed in quotes, to be served in the pews and people aren't supposed to have to come to the table to receive it. And one of the things I really appreciated about your articles, Meg, was the, the participatory nature of music and how it, it draws us in and calls us to get up and take some risks and, yeah. and, and step forward and do things. Um, Rich Richards says, loved what y'all had to share. Uh, so how do we provide an environment a worship experience from the depth of feeling, as Meg said, in our wonderful and sometimes challenging cerebral centric Presbyterian contexts. Um, how do we, yeah, in two minutes, and maybe this can be a closing question for both of you, how do we put these things into practice? Go ahead, Meg. <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but I'm going to start with the music that we use. And um, I try to use a diversity of music styles. It's not just old. It's not just new. I also try to use a diversity of the instrumentation and a diversity of presentation. So in our congregation this year, we started using the Paul Vasile, Glory to God, Whose Goodness Shines on Me. And I think this congregation had done it a while ago, but not recently. And we started adding some claps and some tambourines. And at first it was a little awkward and stiff, 
but we did it for 12, maybe close to 12 weeks. And um, by the end, that was our youth were saying that was their favorite part of worship every week, you know, and people, you could feel them investing in the song as they learned it and could embodied it. And so I think, I think you sort of have to teach people how to let loose a little bit and how to access the depth of their heart. And I also think you have to give them permission to do so, to, to tell people, stop it with the frozen chosen, to, you know, to invite people to be real and slowly practice with, those are baby steps. You can do more once you crack the window open, but um, baby steps. Um, I would challenge you all um to imagine choreography, not just of, you know, the elements on the table or uh, the idea of Jesus when he was being baptized, but of space, of the space in, the, in which you worship, and to see that space not as static. And I think too often we try to protect, you know, the walls and the pillars and uh, was talking with the church recently and I said, oh, we could put nails there and hang something and, and there was a gasp. And so I think we this this idea of space, not as static, but as something we can do something to and something with, and even something simple like putting some fans in to move the banner so that things are moving and something's happening. Because really what, what we're trying to show is the choreography of the people in relationship to the choreography of God, God moving amidst us. And so it may not be floods of water going down the floor. You probably don't want that, but the idea of seeing and participating in the space and having things not there to be decorative, but to be a part of this whole movement. And also to see worship not as a series of little parts, because I, I um, resonate with Meg's idea when people come in and they see communion and they just see it as something tacked on. Is it going to, you know, they often, is your sermon going to be short because we have communion today? And instead to see it as something that this is all one peace and to imagine the holistic part of that and in space the choreography of space particularly how the people will move and how we will celebrate um god's presence with us well thank you both and thank you everyone for taking part in this uh webinar i want to remind you that uh to mark your calendars our next one is on march 2 thursday at the same time um and the featured Panelists will be Marisa Galvan Valle and Lionel Derencourt talking about the creation of a community uh, prayer garden as a as a place of of worship in their congregation. Um, I also want to remind you to register for the 2023 Presbyterian Association of Musicians Worship and Music Conference. You can do that at presbymusic.org. And um, with that, I will say thank you again and go in peace. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings, everyone.